It's the Rink Live podcast. We're in the heart of the October college hockey season and uh, a fun time as we get to know certain teams and uh, what what they're all about. Mick, how you doing? Uh, how, how things going in the in the Granite City? Uh, doing pretty well. There's big uh, big series this weekend in St. Cloud uh, with Mankato at St. Cloud State, so that'll be uh, that'll be pretty exciting. And then the uh, actually it's homecoming week, so uh, the the and the Gophers uh, women's team will be up here playing St. Cloud State. So lots going on. I just you know I know you live close to the campus. It's homecoming in St. Cloud. Be careful. That's all I'm going to say. Well, <laughs> I, I'm not too worried, but thank you. <laughs> I, I know there have been incidents in the past. Let's just say that. No, but yeah, it was like 40 years ago. Well, yeah, but you know, we're all old guys. We remember this stuff. It's all it's all good fun, right? Okay. Hey, um, I cover the Gophers. I got to open the season uh, seeing the new guys in college hockey. Lindenwood University, the Lions, their first year as a Division One program. I witnessed their first game, uh, their first two games, a couple of pretty good games with the with a Gopher team that's ranked pretty highly. Uh, The Lions, I think it's safe to say, have kind of burst onto the scene. Went to Michigan, gave Michigan a couple really good games, got their first Division One win last week. We are happy to be joined by the head coach of the Lions and and a guy that we've known for years, going back to you know me growing up in the Red River Valley when when North Dakota games were on seemingly every weekend. I got to know Rick Zombo a little bit from uh, from what he did on the ice with the then Fighting Sioux and uh, got to talk to Rick a couple of weeks ago here in Minneapolis. Rick, thanks for joining us. How's uh, how's the adventure going so far? Good morning. It's a uh, start of a new day. Every day is challenging. Today's a, a good day because we just finally got our feet on the ground. <laughs> well, uh, talk a little bit about the, that that first win o- o- over Air Force. Uh, you know that that had to be a, just a tremendous moment for for you guys uh, as, as a program. And uh, you know, describe that game. Uh, how 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 did that kind of all come together for you guys? That was scripted extremely well. It was nice to win. You got to get the first one before you look at two. Um, there, there was so much involved with this. I mean, Lindenwood University, the, the program, I've been here 15 years. In, in 2003, they had ice hockey here. Um, never in our wildest dreams did we ever think that we'd be playing at the Division One level. And, and now to make it happen and, and make it happen in short order. When I say short order, uh, our women's program has been playing for eight years. So at that time, we are put on a mandatory hiatus for three years. Um, to get everything in line for our men's program. So Mark Abney and myself, who's my assistant coach, we've been putting together for quite some time and it's all internal. It's the guts of the hockey program. But as you guys probably are familiar with, uh, actually making it happen, um, the rubber stamp came from the president, came from the athletic director, and that all happened in, in short order, which was March, which happened to be the opening day of our national tournament, the ACHA. So from the first week of March up until that win last Friday, um, there's been a lot going on. Rick, let's, let's go back to the beginning with you. Cause as I mentioned, you know, growing up watching North Dakota, you were on a couple of pretty good teams there and and won a national championship. Tell us about the path to college hockey for you. Uh, You know, I I noted on your hockey resume, the Austin Mavericks, one of the kind of the old school USHL teams. Uh, Was that the Lou Vero era in Austin? Did you play, did you play there for him? No, it was after Lou that year. I had uh, three three different coaches. Um, Frank Anzalone was the last one in that season. Lou Gotti was before that. Um, Larry Punch Hill was the original coach when I started in, in Austin. Uh, how I got there, I have zero idea because I was playing grade 11 in Toronto. So when you play in Ontario, it's all about playing major junior. And... Um, really not knowing anything about major junior other than I love the brand of hockey. Everybody in Ontario was going that way. Um, we didn't have representation. My representation was my, my father. All I did was play hockey. And um, I, I, we actually had to find out about the 48 hour rule. Um, I was ended up uh, drafted to Cornwall at that time. Cornwall was drafting Ontario players to play in the queue. I went to the camp, um, Howie the Duck, um, Scott O'Neill, Van Beesbrock. I mean, was, I only spent uh, 48 hours in Cornwall, but as a defense in the planning queue, I didn't feel that that would be best suited for me. Uh, I ended up in Austin, Minnesota, where um, I didn't know anything about it, didn't know anything about the USHL, but it was a, a fine move for me. Uh, I just played hockey and uh, let things fall. Uh, you know, 
it was successful. I mean, I was on World Juniors. We had a good team. Everything about it, just everything fell into place for me. What what was the recruiting process like for you to you know to get to the University of North Dakota? You know, did, were there a number of schools that were interested in you? Uh, did you shop around, or or how did you end up at North Dakota? Uh, I was very intelligent, so I went to school on a pre vet. Um, I could have went to Harvard, so I, I did have a grade. So I had a lot of control of where I was going. Uh, you're allowed four recruiting trips uh, at that time, playing in Austin. Uh, Minnesota North Stars also had five second round picks in that NHL draft in June. So uh, I would have been the first player uh, to play for the Gophers outside of Minnesota. Um, Glenn Sonmore, Lou Nanny, um, all, all big names in hockey. I talked to frequently. I uh, had tickets to not only the Gophers, but also uh, the North Stars. Uh, but my recruiting trips, I, w- I went to North Dakota, uh, Wisconsin, uh, RPI, which was Rensselaer Polytech out in Troy, New York, and, and the Gophers. And uh, I, I really broke it down to uh, the Gophers and uh, North Dakota. Um, it, was, it was a challenging decision. As a matter of fact, they asked my parents to come to Austin and to try to assist me with the decision. And uh, as reluctant as they were, but the pressure I put on them, they said, go play for the Gophers. Mm-hmm. And it, it, probably within a minute afterward, I said, I'm going to know that. <laughs> Come, come to find out, six-hour drive from Chicago is easier for them to attend games than 13 to Grand Forks. But it was unbelievable. I knew I wanted to play pro. Uh, you go to North Dakota, play in the NHL. All six of us freshmen uh, played um, in the NHL. Uh, James Patrick was the first-round pick to the Rangers. I was eighth-round pick to Detroit. Uh, Chris Chelios was on his way up. Uh, he was going to commit to North Dakota. And I think that's a pretty well advertised story where Chelly got cut off by Grant Sandbrook at O'Hare and they drove him up to Badger Bob. Um, but we had a pretty good, you know, we had a pretty good team. You know, you, you talk about North Dakota of that era, that was in the thick of, you know, Gino Gasparini's uh, kind of run there. And, you know, I, I think that was kind of the team of the eighties with you look at what, what he did there. Uh, Gino, obviously a character in his own right, but you, you played with guys like Kerry Eads and we've talked about Eddie Christian before there, there were, that had to be some kind of not only fun hockey on the ice, but some fun stuff off the ice as well. Well, every hockey team has characters <laughs> and the two that you named are definitely characters. Um, one thing about going to North Dakota, you learned a tradition. A tradition gets passed down by veterans. So we had Phil Sykes and Kerry Eads as our captains. They're seniors, you know, that year. Um, it, it's, it's challenging for those players. Mo- most players don't spend four years at North Dakota. And to have that type of leadership still around and, and those two individuals was fantastic. Uh, I think Eddie was, was a uh, sophomore when I was there. Um, but you, you learn what it's like to, uh, to be a fighting Sioux and, and um embrace the, per, the privilege to play there uh just getting ready to watch north dakota play uh the, the gophers this this weekend uh do you have a favorite uh, memory of, of playing against the gophers or are there a couple that come to mind i guess when you think about to that ra- rivalry well everybody hated us and we hated them uh that was before there were actually officials on the ice for warm-up so uh Fairly frequently, the opponent team was pushed to their blue line off center ice and ended up with very few pucks. You know, <laughs> playing in Grand Forks, they had a way of um, sneaking in pelts, whether it be gopher pelts or badger pelts. Or, uh, you know, got an awful lot of notoriety down for the Florida Panthers in their Stanley Cup ring when they're throwing rats out. But it, it all established. There, there was uh, tri- uh, quite a trading company on the ice at Grand Forks, you know, when we would score and um, the place was rocking, you know, you know how cold it is up there. And mm-hmm. They'd have 45 gallon drums burning outside the day before waiting in line for tickets. I mean, the place was shaking um, before you even started putting your equipment on for warm ups. So it was just uh, quite an experience. You mentioned uh, being recruited by Wisconsin. And then of course, as the, the fates of hockey would have it, 1982 national championship game, I believe it was Providence, Rhode Island. And people who were there tell me, uh, you know, about, about a 10,000, maybe 12,000 seat building in Providence. And there were about 10,000 Wisconsin fans there, uh, you know, two Western teams playing on the East coast for the national championship. And, and your team came in and kind of quieted the sea of red. I mean, that had to be a, a career highlight for you. Yeah. Any, anytime that you're fortunate to win a national title, it, it, it's not easy. You know, it, it comes down to one game. Um, 
both programs were extremely familiar with each other. Uh, it turned out to be a dominant game uh, for us. We, we pretty much controlled it, but that was, a, that was a team that had NHL players also on it, you know, so it was competitive. It was 60 minutes of, of, of hard work, but to win your first title as, as a freshman, uh, you think it's going to be easy and you're going to follow, you know, with quite a few after that. And, and I, I truly believe that my sophomore year, we had a better team than my freshman year. I really thought we we're stacked. You know, you, you talk about uh, North Dakota and Brad Berry was a freshman at that time uh, that came in. Um, but we, we lost to Wisconsin in the quarters at home. Uh, and as a matter of fact, I think Frozen Four was, was hosted in, in Grand Forks, if I'm not mistaken. Yes, that's, that's, cor that's correct. That sophomore year, we're, we're better than uh, my freshman year. And then my last year, I was a captain of um, the Fighting Sioux. We went to the Frozen Four. We lost in a uh, uh, couple overtime. You know, then they played the Constellation game. They don't play anymore. Uh, but to finish third, you go to North Dakota, you go, to, go there to win. But we, we lost in double overtime. I think it was Bowling Green, maybe. But I had a good three years. It was unbelievable. <laughs> Uh, you, you played a long time in the, in the NHL, you know, 650 games in the NHL, uh, you, you know, when, as, as your career was winding down, I mean, were, were you always kind of eyeing that th thinking, uh, well, I might want to get into this coaching thing or, or how did you end up uh, in, in coaching Rick? It was uh, for me, uh, people really don't understand what a wonderful life it is to play the national hockey league to not concern yourself with Mondays and, a lot of people in the business world look forward to Fridays. Uh, I just made certain that uh, I cherish every moment that I, I, I stood on the ice, whether it be for practice or a game. Uh, I didn't take anything for granted. You know, at that time, uh, being an American, very few uh, Americans were, were getting an opportunity to play in the National Hockey League. It, the success of the 80 Olympic team opened the doors to a lot of Americans. So I give an awful lot of credit to them. Um, but I, I was just fortunate. I just... I just did my thing. I, I, I followed my passion. You know, it's, it's people only see the results. They, they don't see the process or the means. And there's an awful lot of struggle on the way up. And when you don't have um, anybody behind you to assist you or lubricate doors, um, I appreciate it every time that I was on the ice. Uh, when it came time to finish in my career, I didn't want to be one of those guys that just hung in there for the paycheck. I was pretty pretty established. I had a nice asset base. Um, my children were getting old enough. I didn't want them to be like army brats moving around. Mm -hmm. um, my last year I played in Phoenix, which was LA's farm team. And at that time I, I recognized that uh, I was there mainly to groom and partner up with a young uh, high end pixer playing for the LA Kings. And the coach asked me to be um, a player assistant coach playing for the Phoenix Roadrunners. Mm -hmm. That was extremely challenging because um you get questioned all the time, what side of the fence you're sitting on? Are you on the coach's side or you're on the player's side? And it came very trying for me because um, I was very, and I still am, extremely loyal um, to my teammates. The players are sitting next to me and sitting across. You know, I, I look at playing an uh, NHL very similar to the loyalty that one establishes in, in the military. Obviously, uh, your life is not on the line, um, but it's amazing uh, the walks of adversity that happen every single day and uh, the, the respect that you earn to be a one percenter. So then I started thinking that maybe coaching might be something that I would do. Um, my kids were really established uh, in St. Louis. St. Louis is a great place to live and, and to raise kids. Um, it wasn't so much about the money at that point for me, um, but I knew I was good at it. I was uh, a, a real good communicator, uh, very knowledgeable at the game. Um, it allowed me to duck and dodge or adapt, uh, for me to get, you know, close to 700 games and, uh, primary than, than anything else, it, I was in the process of putting together outdoor shows. So I hunt and I fish. Uh, so I was actually going to be in front of the camera, uh, the year before I got traded to Boston. Uh, I, you know, a, as a player, you don't pay for anything, uh, retail. Um, and I decided to chase down and pursue, you know, a new bass boat and, and, and the archery equipment. And I realized actually that your marketability just doesn't fade. It drops. Like when you're not playing, there's always somebody younger or fresher that comes in. So I'm like, oh, you know, I'll get into this coaching. Um, I recognized that I couldn't coach my child, uh, not due to lack of knowledge, but uh, me personally, uh, I felt the drive home was extremely challenging for me where. 
Uh, I paid more attention to the 14 other sets of eyes instead of my own son. Um, in St. Louis, there's enough alumni uh, that looked after my kids. So I recognize that he was in good hands. And then it was just a matter of uh, finding a niche that worked. So yes, uh, I coached high school here. I coached elite programs at the all-star level of high school. I coached in the NA. I coached in the USHL. Uh, coaching ACHA. I was, I've actually been pretty fortunate uh, to not have to move around and chase a paycheck doing something that I'm so passionately invested in. And then here I am at, at the pinnacle, you know, um, again, never expecting that that would happen, but uh, I'm, I'm very good at what I do and, and, and very confident and, and I'm a firm believer. It's, it's, I use the, the saying, it's easier to coach a triple A player than a B player. Um, so having, having the time with an awful lot of uh, different age groups, um, different levels of ability uh, really uh, allow you to uh, develop the art of coaching. And it, it's coaching is not a science. You know, the internet and the phones have everything. Uh, it, it's more of an art. Um, and, and I feel very confident in that. We're talking to Rick Zombo, longtime NHL defenseman and the head coach at Lindenwood University as the Lions begin their first year adventure as a Division I program. Rick, for those of us in Minnesota who grew up watching the old rough and tumble Norris division, you were a, you were a veteran of a lot of those battles, having started your career with Detroit. You know, and the, the Red Wings had their challenges in the 80s, but I think they were kind of on the upswing and we kind of saw the beginnings of what the Red Wings became in the 90s when you were there. And then you went over to St. Louis to uh, some Blues teams that were a lot of fun. I remember a couple of good playoff battles with the North Stars back in that era as well. Just kind of tell us about your NHL experience, what it was like to, to break in in Detroit at the time you did and, and, uh, and what it was like being a Blue uh, uh, in those early 90s years. So, so I was an eighth round pick. So there's, you're not getting lured out by the money. <laughs> uh, but, but I was I accomplished a lot. I, I knew I wasn't going to finish my veterinarian degree at, at North Dakota. Uh, I knew my pursuit was to play pro hockey. Uh, to play pro hockey is completely different than playing college hockey. So uh, I, I made the decision actually at the national tournament um, that I was going to uh, leave school and play pro. And, and, you know, when I first started, the Red Wings were not good. Um, low to mid fifties uh, was an average as far as their points go. There was a tremendous amount of turnover. The general manager that drafted me in the NHL draft was no longer there. Uh, Jimmy Devolano, who had experience uh, with the Islanders, uh, came over to Detroit and then they started solidifying uh, the future of the Red Wings. So the future of the Red Wings was all established in upstate New York, which is Adirondack. So in Glens Falls, New York, we started building the tradition and, and building the young guys all of us. Uh, high-end players were, were put into Adirondack to learn the craft, to understand what it's like to travel on a bus and, and, and sack your lunch. Uh, and we actually won the Calder Cup my second year there. So my first two years in Detroit, I got called up and uh, I think I played 15 games. But we won the Calder Cup. And, and, and when, you, when you learn in American Hockey League uh, uh, how to win a seven-game series, uh, it really solidifies um, the, the metal that you need to, to survive, uh, playing an 82 game season in an NHL is not easy. Uh, then you're talking about, um, uh, probably 10 exhibition games and then, um, potentially 28 games to win the cup, uh, playing in the Norris division, everything was a battle, uh, whether it be an exhibition game or a playoff game, it, it was, it was beyond hatred. It, it was, uh, survival, um, uh, in, in the early 80s, it wasn't quite the 70s, but the game of intimidation was extremely important. And you, you learn that you got to make certain you carry your lunch. So uh, I had no problem fighting. I, I, I knew how to fight. I was good at fighting. Uh, but also I was fortunate uh, that I had two fellows by the name of Bob Probert and Joe Kosher uh, that we started together in the minors um, and then uh, played together in Detroit. So when you're playing in the Norse uh, division, and on right wing, you have Proby and, and also Joey. Uh, the whole left side of the Norris Division are a bunch of monkeys. Um, and, you know, I, I learned that it is uh, pretty smart to keep my gloves on and jump off the railroad tracks uh, because they were coming. And um, I got to a point where I established myself where, you know, at that time, uh, you had to fight. A defenseman had to fight. Uh, 100 penalty minutes was... Uh, 
average standard. And as an American or a college player, uh, it was very frequent daily that you would get challenged. So uh, I was able to carry my own, but smart enough uh, not to fight the big guys. Um, then, then I made a, a craft at uh, playing against the best players in the NHL. So I, I was uh, labeled a defensive defenseman. I marked up with all the top scorers and was actually really good at it. Um, uh, I had not only the ability um, just not to think defensively, but to think offensively and, and get ahead of the next play. And you, people might think it's, it, it's uh, you know, you're talking about Mario, you're talking, talking about Gretz. Um, they're the best in the world. But to think that you're close, uh, as I did every single day, I wasn't enamored by any press clippings. Um, I knew that I had the ability and, and, and I made a living at it. Well, talk about, uh, you know, you, you talked earlier about, uh, you know, it was finally fi finalized in March that you, you guys were going to move up to Division One. Putting together this schedule, uh, I'll just give people an idea of if, if they haven't taken a look. Minnesota, Michigan, <laughs> Wisconsin, Denver, Vermont, North Dakota. I mean, you, you guys are not exactly um, just kind of gliding into the Division One era. How how'd you kind of put together the schedule? How difficult was it to, to get this schedule together in a short amount of time? I, I've been raised and I've always been one. Even uh, in the ACHA days, I always tried to have the heaviest, best schedule. Um, <sighs> Division One schedules are usually done by January. Mm -hmm. It wasn't until March uh, that we got rubber stamped by the president. So we played that first game. The very next day, my staff was on getting on the phone and calling. Um, relationships have been established back in August, uh, but because we didn't have any clarity uh, by that at one time athletic director, uh, everybody is pretty much ghosted. Our recruiting was ghosted. Our, our schedules were ghosted. I couldn't say anything because I didn't have anything to say or, or know what to say. Um, but we want to make certain that um, it's almost like Korean ingenuity. You got to play the best. You got to see what's out there. You got to challenge yourself. And on top of it, in, in St. Louis, we got to sell the game. Selling uh, college hockey, Division One college hockey is extremely important. Youth hockey here is really, really good. But to sell the game, you got to you have to have the big names. You need the big people that are coming in. And fortunate enough, and 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 almost. Um, it's tough to shape the humility that, that I carry with me. The fraternal order of coaches, these guys did not have to give us an opportunity. These coaches did not have to play us. Um, we put together, I thought getting 20 games would be uh, shooting for the stars. And, and we, we finalized 30 competitive games in nine days. It's just not Lindenwood University. The opportunity of the opponents giving us games, they're making calls for other coaches, adjusting. It was unbelievable the amount of work uh, that was going on to put together this schedule. And, and I'm sure a lot has to do with, um, I hope anyway, the way I carry myself and has always carried myself and, um, and carry that respect because uh, it, it's short-lived. You know, all coaches know that there's never a severance plan or retirement plan. And uh, you just give everybody a fair shake and we're fortunate that we've got a schedule this year. Rick, the schedule is one thing, obviously. I saw your team a couple of weeks ago, and you have a, 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 a I would say, a, a competitive roster. You know, I watched Joe Prouty play last year in the NAHL for, for New Mexico, and uh, walking into your first game, here's a bunch of people in a, in a parking lot in Minneapolis, and they all have Lindenwood stuff on. It was the Prouty family, and they said, we're having the first ever Lindenwood College Hockey tailgate party. So, you know, it's kind of neat to see how, how people have really embraced this. But talk about putting your roster together. Where, uh, where, where did you go looking for players, and how tough of a sell job is it to, to get kids to try and uh, be pioneers with a new program? Uh, I, I don't care what sport you're, you're coaching. I think recruiting is 70, 80% success. It's, it's all about recruiting. Uh, I, I know the type of players that I want to coach. That's most important. Um, having our identity and not changing our identity makes it easier as far as identifying players uh, to watch games. Uh, in the past, I've always had four coaches watching games. That's, that's before the software that we have now. Uh, building that database becomes a, a Christmas shopping list. It's the um, vetting those lists is extremely important. It's, it's really a, a deep dive when it comes to finding the right players because um, recruiting is sales. Both sides have to be happy. 
Uh, it's very simple for, uh, for me to sell myself and Lindenwood to sell itself, uh, but to actually get them on campus uh, is challenging. Uh, dur during the era of the COVID, uh, th these Zoom calls really assisted um, not having much of a budget or the tentacle or uh, the tentacles to reach out. Um, so a lot of it was done by, by phone. And, and then uh, I was pretty much selling the invisible. You know, selling the invisible, not until you get somebody here, can they really sink their teeth in and, and feel it? And, and I think in, 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 uh, in all recruiting, um, your returning players uh, assist on the commit. They, they, they assist on, on the closure, which we didn't have. So uh, to say it, it was a handful, it was, um, but I'm very happy with what we have. Um, we didn't have to go through what would be considered the competitive market of recruiting and uh, hearing that players are playing out their option because when we started in March, you know, most of the players were solidified or committed. And, you know, now there, there, there are so many young uh, players that are early commits. Um, but we, we knew that... The, it's about a foundation, build a foundation, right? Um, to be able to move up and down the lineup. If, if, if you've got 12 forwards and half a dozen defensemen that understand that, uh, and, and you hear these, these phrases all the time, uh, you know, the logo on front better than the name on the back. I sell the name on the back. It's most important that the guys carry themselves. The family name is foremost. Uh, then it's the university. Then it's me and, and my integrity. And, and uh, I ask pretty challenging questions. And if I sense that uh, they rock a little bit on their heel, it's, it's really not for me um, because it, it's just, uh, it's such a competitive market and, and so challenging uh, for a player. They all think that they, you know, it's all about scholarships and families have so much time uh, and money committed into youth hockey and, and finally getting to the point where it's perceived as uh, uh, receiving dividends, uh, it's it's also a big jolt to the, their self-esteem. Uh, they're, they're really the big deal uh, when you're playing uh, Division One college hockey. Uh, and players don't know um, the time management and the commitment that's really necessary um, to get a degree and be good in school. See, So when they talk about uh, student athletes, it's really overused. It's about getting your degree and get the heck out of school. So I push these guys uh, to get out in three and a half years uh, to run an average of 15 credit hours a semester. Anybody can do that. Um, and uh, I recruit and uh, I preach on a daily basis, learning how to be comfortable in an uncomfortable situation. Like every single day when you're on campus, you're getting scouted, not as a hockey player, but you're getting scouted as a student. You're carrying your family name. You're carrying my name. Uh, the university doesn't care if they're going to win a national title or be an All-American at Lindenwood University. It's can they wear the banner, wave that banner of being a successful alumni. That's most important to Lindenwood. And we do a fine job placing uh, students after they get the BA. So to get the JOB after the BA becomes foremost, we talk about that in recruiting calls nonstop. As far as the coaching staff, we talk about uh, the lessons learned on the ice rink mirror um, what it's like in the real world. So uh, when goals and assists and wins and losses don't mean a damn thing, it's can you keep a roof over your head and feed your children? Those are the type of players that not only I'm trying to recruit, but also we solidify those messages as far as being a strong young man. And uh, I treat them like my own kid. Mm -hmm. You know, my, my children... Um, it's a uh, very little Gucci goose. There's an, lot, there's an awful lot of compassion, but it's, it's definitely black and white. And, uh, and I think through, through coaching, I've learned a lot that as much as I know um, that it's a dictatorship for me, uh, the listening component of uh, coaching is foremost and, and um, getting better at that has been a process for the last half dozen years. And, 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 and again, I, I think it, it's an art the, to actually do the X's and O's. I do that in my sleep. It, it, it is, it's the cell. It's the cell that, you know, there's, there's not a player that doesn't want to score a goal. It's the cell of how do you defend? And, um, I, and I coach uh, completely different than what I see. I, I see um, a lot of players that I've got to break down bad habits. doesn't mean that they're a coach strong. They're just, 
um, they, they present themselves on the ice strictly to please the coach. Uh, and if the coach is trying to put a round peg into a square hole, that's going to be a struggle all year and, and nobody's happy. So it's really coming to an understanding of uh, who, who my players are before they come here, solidify and, and actually have two way conversations, not only with myself, but my coaching staff is, is far more important than designing systems or, or, or drills. Um, it's about getting to know the players and allowing them to get to know me uh, without getting too close because as, as much of a, of a giver that I am, um, I know how in the hands of the wrong pe- uh, person it could be uh, perceived as a weakness or vulnerable. But, um, Rick, what, what, what are your facilities like uh, d- down there? Uh, you know, are, are you guys on campus, uh, you know, weight room, you know, all that sort of thing? You know, where, where are you guys at, uh, you know, in terms of facilities down there? Well, I, I say that uh, we're very recruitable. We're not Mariucci, we're not Yost, okay? So when, when I say that, we've been fortunate. Our facility is three years old. It's two mm-hmm. exits down from campus, so we're a tenant. Mm-hmm. So it's three and a half rinks here. When I say three and a half rinks, there's three under a roof and one outside. Um, we have a 2,500-seat arena. It's a bowl configuration with Jumbotron. Uh, Lindenwood has a whole backside, all of our hockey programs. Uh, the second rink is uh, St. Louis Blues practice facility. So the whole north end of that is their training grounds. And, you know, they got good digs there. Uh, and then the third rink is the Blues alumni rink. So we, we're fortunate that there's almost 42 uh, Blues alumni that make their home here. Uh, we skate three times a week. One thing about Centene Community Ice Center, there's always uh, very influential and knowledgeable hockey people that are walking through here on a daily basis. So... Um, our game is fortunate enough, you know, our, our game that we won against Air Force, the whole uh, coaching staff for the Blues was in attendance. Uh, quite a few Blues alumni was in, in attendance. Uh, current players of the St. Louis Blues was in attendance. Uh, I, was, I was extremely proud uh, that they would come in, in support. Um, I mean, it, they don't have to, you know what I mean? Like um, Coach Berube, he offers all the time. I could sit in on his coaching meeting, you know, pre-practice. It's, it's <clears throat> the Blues do not funnel Lindywood University money, but the Blues understand what it's like to give back in the community. Um, is it's on? We're fortunate. We share the same facility uh, with the St. Louis Blues, and and uh, everybody's all behind the success of Lindywood University. I mean, it's just it's a privilege. We're talking with Rick Zombo, head coach at Lindenwood University. Rick, looking at your schedule this year, a lot of hotel rooms, a lot of uh, a lot of road trips this year. What does the future look like that way? I, I'm expecting you've talked to conferences about about potentially, you know, joining a joining a conference down the road. What uh, what do you see in your crystal ball for the next few years as far as scheduling and conference affiliation? Well, our scheduling is full swing right now for for next year. Um, being in a conference, you're only allowed. Uh, 10 independent games or out of conference, out of conference games. So yep. uh, as much as I'd like to be in a conference, uh, that's up to, uh, for the athletic director to negotiate. So uh, St. Louis is geographically pretty set for, for a lot of opponents. Um, if you look at geographically, the CCHA becomes um, pretty attractive. Um, the NCHC, if, if, if you don't mind getting beat up every day, that's attractive. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Obviously, the Big Ten is out, uh, and then it's the Atlantic, you know, so it's up for the athletic director to um, negotiate it and work that out. Uh, for me, it's just about winning games and, and, and making set certain that we're attractive. You know, you have to have a competitive team, it, um, whether it be a league commissioner or opponents, they want to see that it's not, you know, a program that's going to die in the vine. You know, for me to say and repeat the words of the president, They've made a major investment uh, for men's hockey to go to Division One. They have. So um, nobody uh, that has ever started a business or works uh, for any company would start anything when your P&L statement is in the red. Uh, Lindenwood understands it and, and is moving in that direction. So um, doing our schedule and doing our thing, uh, I coached. Um, I'm the front man of the program. I'm the front man when it comes to um, – 
introducing people that have the capacity to donate. Um, and, and the athletic that, that does his thing. The president does his thing. Um, having a schedule is, is most important. I mean, we've got four weekends on, on Big Ten Network. We've solidified two additional Big Ten teams uh, for next season. Um, it's just making certain that uh, our product is good. Yeah, you know, along those lines, uh, you know, with uh, you know n now with with being individual one program and uh, in, in having you know a little bit of a uh, at least a few games under your belt, I, I would imagine that's is that open. I get some more doors, I guess, for you guys in terms of recruiting. I mean, just just in terms of yeah, a little bit more recognition for for players seeing that. We got no recognition from anybody. Okay, <laughs> if I, I do want to like fluff me and everybody else. We got nobody knew who we were or what we were doing, and and everybody had us counted out. So, as I sell the program and I talk to our staff and I talk to our players, we just go work. Just put your head down and, and go work. Be humble about it. Uh, I knew that we we're going to have an emotional hangover, you know, for our Saturday game against the Air Force. So I knew that. Um, but it, there's there's two sides to, to our program. It, it's the internal sides that I keep, how I measure success and, and um, how I approach my players in our season. And then there's perception. And I don't worry about anything that's outside of my realm. Um, I can lead you into the right questions, um, but I'm going to, you know, I'm just straight up and I honest uh, everything uh, so that, that there's clarity. Um, I just take care of my own work. And, and hopefully it speaks for itself. I've done the homework. Uh, the four teams prior to us, I know what their records were uh, their first year. I know how long it took them uh, to get close to 500, uh, but that's their program. So I don't follow anybody, to be honest with you. I don't think anybody that's successful in life follows somebody else's lead. I just do my thing. And, 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 and I know that I've got the, um, the longest fall. Like I get it, but, but um if there was any kind of insecurity that I had, whether we're playing Minnesota or whether we're playing AIC, which we play this weekend, I'm a fool. You know, I, I can't sell that to my guys. So I just do my work. I got to plan for the day, plan for the week and, and plan for the whole season. And it's not to discredit anybody else. It's just, I keep stuff inside and, and I'm confident in what I do and uh, we get better. That's Rick Zombo. He's the head coach at the Lindenwood Lions. Before we go, Rick, number one, I want to thank you for this conversation. It's been fantastic. And number two, um, there's stuff you see on the ice that, that really impresses upon you as a college hockey writer. And, and there's stuff you see off the ice. And I, I, there was a moment before your first game at Minnesota. I was covering it. I was walking around the arena concourse. Your team was on the ice warming up. And I, and I talked to you just briefly on the concourse. And you were just almost like a fan watching your team warm up for the first time. And you admitted it was a pretty emotional moment for you. That that had to be a, a, a pretty special thing to see kind of things come together and see your team taking warm-ups in a, in a big-time college hockey rink the first time. Just tell us about that moment. You, you read me well, Jesse. Um, I was like a father, uh, really trying to soak it in without getting too emotional. Um, I got an awful lot of, lot of acquaintances in hockey, okay? Um, the, the value of having those acquaintances, you, you never know. Um, I had, when I lived in Austin, I had um, a young couple come up to me. It was a housing child that I lived with in Austin, Minnesota. Um, I ran camps uh, for Jay Robinson Wrestling, not only at Ritter, I, I ran them um, at Mariucci. I, I knew a lot of people there. Um, and, and I was trying hard um, not to be rude, but to acknowledge that. Uh, it sparked a lot of really good memories. Um, but by watching the warm-ups there, I was like a, a pretty proud dad watching my team down on the ice and, and, and making certain that uh, my players were focused. I knew what we're in for. Uh, I, as I talked to you, those Gopher fans should be so appreciative of the dynamic talent that is on that ice. I had the best seat in the house. I mean, it, it is phenomenal to see high-end college hockey players. And uh, we got to participate and, and compete against them.
and you, and you gave him a good run. Rick Jombo, head coach of the Lindenwood Lions in their first season, uh, you know, making a splash already in college hockey. We really appreciate you joining us, Rick, and we look forward to seeing you uh, at a rink somewhere down the road. I'm sure we will. Guys, I appreciate it. It's, uh, I, be on your show is unbelievable. Thank you. That's Mick Hatton. I'm Jess Myers. This is the Rink Live podcast for another week. Catch all of our content on therinklive.com, and we will see you at the rink.